Hey, my name is Carlos Reyes. I was brought to this country illegally through a sewer system. I'm now a multimillionaire and I'm one of the passionate few. Today's interview with Omar was by far my favorite and I've done hundreds of these type of episodes if not thousands. It took me back to, you know, when I was born into extreme poverty in Mexico, being brought over to this country illegally by my mother through a sewer system. And then we also went down my journey as an entrepreneur and how I was able to build an empire, multi-million dollar empire in the world of entrepreneurship. So what I hope for is that after watching this episode, you get fired up and take some action. Let's go. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Passion and Few podcast today. It's your host, Omar here. And today we have a very special story as we get to sit down with none other than Mexican immigrant, Carlos Reyes, a man who came to this country as a young kid twice through crazy circumstances, which you'll hear in this interview, but also how he came from such humble beginnings, having barely anything growing up in Mexico, to becoming a multi-million dollar entrepreneur into the eight figures, running over two dozen companies and now starting the all-in movement, where he's helped coach thousands of entrepreneurs all around the country about how they can invest in real estate and how they can take control of their financial destiny with the vehicle of wholesaling real estate and so much more. So I promise you, you will be inspired to no end by this incredible story about a man who married his high school sweetheart, made his dreams a reality, and is now helping you guys do the exact same thing, Carlos Reyes. And also, don't forget, if you're watching this interview at any point, you get inspired and you go, wow, I love this story. I would love to share my story and be interviewed on the show, either in person or via Zoom right here on The Passionate View, so that you can reach an audience of potential customers, clients, and raving fans to learn about you and your mission. Well, you're in luck because you can apply right now or at the end of this interview in the description below to fill out our short questionnaire to see if you'd be a good fit to be interviewed right here on the show. But with no further ado, let's sit back, relax, and enjoy this powerful interview with none other than Carlos Reyes. Enjoy. Our incredible guest, Carlos yes, Reyes. Thank you, brother. Thanks for being on the show today, man. It's an honor. It's an honor and it's a privilege and I appreciate you, uh, you know, taking the time. Absolutely, I can't wait. man. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having us here in your beautiful office. I see thank you got you. the whole setup. So let's get right into your story, man. Before we get into the business and how you became a multimillionaire, take us back to the very beginnings. You know, where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? And sort of where did this whole journey for you begin as a kid? Do you want the PG-13 version or do you the, want like the real raw? Rated R. Okay. Give, me, give me the real raw, Okay. straight to the core, yeah. Uh, I was born in a small town called, uh, well, it's, a, it's the capital of a northern state called uh, Hermosillo, Hermosillo, Sonora, mm -hmm. which is uh, northern part of Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born there. And uh, my, uh, you know, my 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 mother, uh, she had to flee, like get away from my father, mm -hmm. because um, he was he would come home, you know, as a, a, a coke addict and a drunk, and uh, he was working for the uh, federales at the time. Mm -hmm. One time, you know, she uh, <laughs> he put he put me as a two year old and my mother against the wall and started shooting at us, and. Uh, well, that was that was like the the boiling point. That's where my mom said, "You know what? Uh, we got to run away from from this man." Uh, wow. And uh, and then we went an hour and a half south to a small town called Guayma, Sonora. Mm -hmm. We were hiding out in my grandma's house uh, for the remaining time until wow. my mom made her way to the United States. So we went to uh, Guayma, Sonora. Um, and you know, I always tell people, you know, I didn't have uh, running uh, electricity or running water mm -hmm. uh, up until around the sixth grade. So a lot of people don't even know what that's like, right? They don't even know what it feels like to, to have to uh, shower out of a bucket, you know? And mm -hmm. the way that we would get our water uh, is we had a, a truck filled with water that would come around the neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? Now you have to imagine, this is like dirt roads and we had dirt floors, mm -hmm. right? And we had like laminate roofing and the structure of the house, man, I mean, if I ever show you a picture, which I will, mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's almost like, you know, it's definitely th like third world country like. Right. Um, so this truck would come around once a week and he, we would have these big old buckets in the front yard and we would pump water from that truck to those buckets, oh. to those big containers. Yeah. That's where we would get our, our, our drinking water. Mm -hmm. And that's where we would get our, our, uh, you know, bathing water and, you know, washing the clothes, all that stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's how I, I pretty much grew up, man. It was like gas lamps, mm -hmm. uh, water, you know, where she would literally warm up in a fireplace warm up the water, and then that's how we would take showers. And then in the backyard, we had a what's called a lavadero, which means a washing board. That's how we washed our clothes, <laughs> right. right? And then we had hangers, and we used to hang our clothes with these you know, wooden hangers on these wires. 
And then my grandfather built a back house where uh, we would use the restroom, you know, like a, a, a back house made out of wood mm -hmm. with a little bit of a wood structure coming out, a hole, and that's where you would use the restroom. Um, that's kind of how wow. I grew up, you know. And how, how long did you, like, how old were you when you lived that until you guys ran away, so, or what was it? So a lot of folks don't understand this, but, you know, uh, I didn't even know that I had uh, I had a lot of trauma until I started doing a lot of personal development work. Right, yeah, yeah. Right, I started doing what's called shadow work, and I started peeling back the layers of the onion, um, cause I, I didn't know we, we, we have so much trauma, uh, mm -hmm. as children that we don't even understand, like we don't, we don't even know, we're not even it. aware of that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I had a lot of trauma and it was hurting me in, in a lot of ways, not only in my relationship with my, you know, beautiful wife, my, you know, uh, uh, high school sweetheart, um, you know, my ability to be there uh, as a significant other. Mm -hmm. And it was also hurting me as a father. Uh, so I started doing the personal development work in March of 2019 because I knew that that something wasn't right inside of me. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine this, right? Imagine being extremely poor, right? To where, you know, my first job was, you know, as a, as a child, as a kid, maybe four to five years old, I'm knocking door to door selling bread, right? That was my first ever entrepreneur uh, job. How old are you? Uh, about five years old wow. at this time. So my, um, imagine this, right? My mother's like, hey, you know, I, I want better for you, for you. I want better for your, your brother. Um, you know, my mom, man, that's where I'll, and I'll explain this a little, a little later. I got a lot of my hustle, a lot of my programming, a lot of my courage from my mother, my single, you know, single mom uh, who doesn't speak English to this day. Right. Mm -hmm. So and they've actually, you know, uh, some of the people, some of them, Danny and Patrick, they've all met her here. Actually, they met her last week. Uh, so my mom says, you know, hey, I want I want a better life for you. I, I know that, you know, we don't have the money for you guys to even get educated here. Mm -hmm. So I know that this is not going to turn out good. And I want you guys to have a better life than I did. So imagine being a five-year-old kid who's already suffered all that trauma. Mm -hmm. And then your mother unintentionally has to like abandon you for two years. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You can only imagine what that does to a person, to a child. At this point, I'm, I'm just like, I'm crying every night. I got, you know, I got her picture under my pillow and I'm just like crying. I'm asking my grandmother like why she left. Mm -hmm. And you know, my mother, my grandma did her best in, you know, trying to explain, hey, she left because she wants a better life for you. But when you're a child, man, all you want is your mother's, you know, your mother's company and, and love. You don't care. You don't understand, you know, yeah. fi financials and you don't understand, you know, uh, careers and, you know, uh, uh, right. economics and anything like that. So uh, at that point, man, I'm just like, my mom left me. My mom abandoned me. She left me here with my grandma. And, uh, and I had to go, you know, suffer through that for a while. So after two years, uh, by the way, the, the most, the, the, the best day for me was Fridays at 5 PM because my mother, we didn't have running water, electricity, telephone, the, the neighbor across, uh, across the street had a telephone mm -hmm. and, uh, he actually had a brick home. We didn't have a brick home. Mm -hmm. He had a brick home. He had a telephone. He had electricity. So on Fridays at 5 PM, my mother would call there mm -hmm. to tell us that she was okay and things like that. Oh, okay. That was like the best time of, you know, best time of my childhood is like looking forward to Friday, 5 PM, you know? Oh, wow. So I would go across and she would just like, you know, call us, uh, back then she would use those calling cards. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, she would call us there, uh, put 10, 20 bucks into this calling card, call us and let us know that she was doing her best to, to, to provide for us and to get us over to the United States of America at some point. So after two years, uh, pass, she finally makes enough, uh, she finally saves enough mm -hmm. and, you know, sets up the infrastructure for us to come over into Escondido, California, which is in San Diego County. Mm -hmm. So she uh, courageously tries to, uh, she has my brother and her left arm and she's dragging me with her right arm and she's getting us through a sewer system, wow. right? And we get caught the first time. Mm -hmm. We get kicked back out to San Isidro, which is like Tijuana and San Isidro. How did you guys get caught? We got caught the first time. How did you guys get caught? Well, immigration caught us. <laughs> they just and they just they they they, they had they were very uh do, do they were very it? do you remember that? I, I do actually. I I remember you know at this point yeah. I do remember some gl you know, glitches of yeah, yeah, you know yeah. some glances, wow. and I remember uh, us being kicked out and then having to go back to my aunt's house in TJ, waiting two days to attempt our you know <laughs> our crversover again, yeah, your right? Second pilgrimage, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, sir. So this time we make it. Yeah. And uh, we this get on the sewer. Yep. Sewer system in San Isidro, uh, San Isidro, which is a border wow. of California. And uh, we're talking like an underground sewer. Yeah, It's like a sewer yeah. system. Yeah. Wow. We got caught and we got kicked out. And second time we made it. Yeah. We get to Escondido and we're like, man, I've never seen. You know, I've never lived in a place that had a carpet. Mm -hmm. Right. We're in an apartment. There's carpet. 
there's lights, there's electricity. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm at this in heaven. Point. Man, I'm, yeah. it's like the land of milk and honey. <laughs> I'm playing right. with the water. I'm rolling around in the grass. You know what I mean? Like really, it was, yeah, yeah. it was something unreal. Yeah. You know, it's like super. I mean, it was something unreal. And I'm so excited. I didn't speak English or anything like that, but this was around uh, entering the third grade. Mm -hmm. And we get there, and my mom is still working the fields. That's how she actually got her paperwork, uh, mm -hmm. her uh, her uh, uh, immigration status, right, right. Uh, here in America. Is she got it through amnesty through working the fields? Mm -hmm. So third grade, I, I get there, and I'm, I'm staying after school to learn English, right. Uh, a lot of back then people were pretty brutal. Uh, I'm being I'm being called the W word. Uh, you know what the W word is? No. No. Uh, it's wetback. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm being called a wetback uh, uh, just about every day of the week. Right. Uh, so you know it's it was it was kind of brutal. You back got a chip then. on your shoulder at that. Point. I do. Yeah. I do. And so I'm I'm like I'm learning English at a speed that you wouldn't believe. I mean, as you can tell, I don't have much of an accent. You know, right. I'm 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 just learning English as a kid, uh, and, and you know, I learn English. Uh, I I finally start to be accepted, yeah. you know, as a, as not an, as an immigrant, you know, because I was looked at as an immigrant first, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it wasn't so much the um, the white folks that were treating me that way; it was the Hispanic folks, it was the Chicanos. Mm. They were treating me that way, you know, with like a lot of uh, discrimination, and hatred. Right. Um, actually, one of my best friends, uh, named was Patrick McCormick. He was mm. a white guy, and I used to play basketball with him, and I was. Pretty damn poor then, so he would bring these peanut butter uh, sandwiches that he would put M and M's on, mm -hmm. and uh, and he would give me one of those out of his own lunchbox, yeah, right? Because yeah. we were pretty poor back then too. Wow. So anyway, we lasted, brother. When I say we lasted about a year and a half, uh, two years, uh, we we failed completely uh, economically, like financially, we failed. Mm -hmm. And I remember the toughest drive I ever had anywhere was literally in a black Nissan truck. My, my mom's name is Jaime. He's driving us back to Tijuana to just... Yeah. Now we're, we're volunteer... After we went through all that right. sacrifice, we're voluntarily leaving this country mm -hmm. because at this point we were under we were living under a tree for a few days yeah and my, like we were living under a tree we couldn't literally afford, under a tree literally under a tree in escondido california we couldn't afford uh an apartment we couldn't afford anything mm -hmm. and my mom's like well let's go back right yeah so uh what i will say this about my mother is uh i'm now in the fifth grade and we go back and my mom has a plan she i, I was always like the, the the man of the house mm -hmm. i'm the oldest you know, we didn't have my father, so I was the man of the house. Mm -hmm. And she sits down with me and she says, hey, mijito, which means my son. She says, "We're this isn't the end of us. We're, we're going to make it back. We're going to come back. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I have a plan. And I'm like, well, what's your plan, mom? Right? I'm in the fifth grade. She's like, well, you're going to work bagging groceries at a retail company called La Ley, which is like a Walmart. You're going to bag groceries, and I'm going to go work cleaning these resorts uh, in the, the hotels mm -hmm. in San Carlos Bay. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, and, and what's going to, you know, what are we going to do? Well, with the money that I make, which the money she makes, mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna, we're going to survive, we're going to pay our bills and our food and stuff, and with the money that you make, I'm going to save uh, from that, and I'm going to get back on the bus, and uh, I got some friends in Phoenix, and I'm going to make it back. So, sure thing, man, uh, I went to, uh, I went there fifth grade, sixth grade in Mexico, and uh, like I said, I didn't have running water or electricity. So imagine like going from like heaven back to poverty, right? Right. Uh, she, we save up enough money. She gets on the bus. She makes it to Phoenix. So here goes another year of not having my mom in my life. Mm. And uh, she brings me over first. This time she pays a coyote, uh, which is a person that helps you cross the border mm -hmm. illegally. She pays him $25 to, to jump me through a fence this time. Mm -hmm. And imagine being, uh, at this point, I'm, I'm about to, I'm between 6th and 7th grade. I think I'm about 9, 10 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, and imagine uh, telling, you know, hey, you're going to listen to this man. I'm going to be on the other side. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be at the McDonald's on the other side waiting for you. Listen to this man. He's going to bring you to me, mm -hmm. right? Whatever he tells you to do, do it. So imagine being a, a, still a kid at this mm -hmm. point. I'm not even a teenager. So he's telling me to run, duck, jump, and I'm doing it, right? Because I, I, my mom told me that he was going to bring me over to her. Right. So sure thing. I listen. I get through. She meets me. She pretty much contrabands me up to Phoenix, Arizona. Wow. And in 1997, she starts my paperwork process. And uh, that's how I made my way to this country. Holy cow, man. Yeah. And then when you get to this country, obviously, there's an point where you realize the, you know, the difference between Mexico and the U.S. Clearly. At what point did you start going, man, I want I want something more for my life? Did you start at that I, I made a age? fatal mistake. Okay. What was that? I 
I, I got comfortable. I became Americanized. <laughs> yeah. I made a fatal mistake. I, uh, How so? How do you feel that you became Americanized? I just got comfortable. I got comfortable. I mm. forgot about, you know, my uh, tolerance for risk. Um, I forgot about, you know, everything that I, I, I've been through because the way that my mind works is I've always tried to forget. Mm -hmm. I've always tried to forget, you know, like, mm -hmm. I, and remember, that's why I had to do the personal development because I needed to face those shadows mm -hmm. and uh, I needed to face them, you know, head on. What I used to do is I would selectively forget mm -hmm. the, the trauma, the pain, the suffering, right? Sweep it under the rug. Yeah. I would sweep it. I would put it in the back of, you know, those yeah. files, right? Those yeah. memory files. And so I became an American. Right. I, I started, uh, I went to school, you know, went to mm -hmm. middle school. Uh, I went and you know, got great grades, went to high school, um, you know, got a job. Right. Uh, started working my way up the corporate ladder. You know, pff, forget forget the Mexican kid that went through all that. Mm -hmm. I started becoming Americanized. So, um, you know, was your was your dream or were you aspirational at that point or did the big dreams kind of kick in later? You know, late teens you know what's something? crazy yeah. at, at the age of, you know, Man, a, a lot of my, a lot of my, I had to tap back into my, my childhood, mm -hmm. you know, my, my, my child self, my inner child self. Right. To even just bring all that back. And I'll mm -hmm. tell you the way that happened. I'm in the seventh grade and as soon as, and I'm, I'm already, you know, I'm already in the seventh grade here in America. Mm -hmm. And they say, Hey, write down what you want to be when you grow up. Mm -hmm. Right. They have this, this, this report. And, uh, I remember it. I remember it. Like I remember it like it was yesterday and I wanted to be a uh, Navy SEAL, mm -hmm. a police officer, mm -hmm. A lawyer or a real estate investor, <laughs> right? Because why, I want why real estate investor. Well, for one, um, I just wanted to build houses. Mm -hmm. I wanted to like build houses, and you know, because I I always bounced around, you mm -hmm. know, from house to house. Mm -hmm. So I kind of just wanted to build build houses for other families. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know that it paid so well, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, I, I I thank God, and you know, I praise the Lord that I chose the career to actually pay the the best because. I actually went to uh, the police academy. Mm -hmm. I went to South Long Police Academy. How old were you when you went there? Uh, I went to the police academy in my mid twenties. So you didn't have you weren't like killing it in your early twenties, late teens, and already on your journey. No, I was I was sure. working I was working my way up the corporate ladder, right. you know, and I and I made okay money, right, 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 and okay money means about seventy k a year, mm -hmm. right, uh, which is considered you know middle right, class right. America, right. Um, but you know I wasn't I wasn't crushing it, man. I'll tell yeah. you the way I was living, you know, I didn't. I didn't start out making 70 K a year, right? right I started right, out right. making, you know, like 10, 25 an hour, you right. know? So the, the way that it worked is as soon as I can get a job, as soon as I was like, you know, a, a legal and a teenager, uh, you know, I, I was helping my mother. I was, you know, I was working at, you know, different places and I was bringing home the money and mm -hmm. I was going to give it to my mother so we can pay the electricity, the rent, mm -hmm. the food. You know, I had other siblings under me, you know, a brother and a sister. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was always the man of the house. Right. And then yeah. the other thing that I was doing, I was saving up enough money, and I had this little envelope, and it was called uh, Reyes House, because mm -hmm. we, my mom, my mom to this day has never owned a home, you know, to this mm -hmm. day. I retired her in 2017, and uh, you know, she didn't actually have her own spot until I gave her her own spot, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So I granted her her own spot. Wow. So she never owned a home, you know, through our our upbringing. So I'm sitting here putting, you know, I'm giving her money, and I'm putting money away in this envelope, and I I, I saved up about six thousand dollars. And then just like, just like every other middle uh, class America, American out there, something happens and then that gets completely pulverized, right. right? Disintegrated. Like here I am saving for our house, our first ever home. Right. And then like something comes up uh, and then it's like, oh, okay, mom, we'll take from there. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we still didn't get our home. So uh, that was something that, you know, as even as a teenager, like I always had aspirations of like helping my mother because of everything we've been through. And the one thing that I told her when I was five years old, believe it or not, and this is a story that she always tells me is we're walking to my grandma's house in Mexico mm -hmm. and she's grabbing me by the hand. And I clearly remember. And she says, she says, you used to always tell me at the age of five, you used to always tell me that one day you were going to have your own business and that I was never going to have to worry about a dollar or a cent ever again. Mm -hmm. You know, she always tells me that story and mm -hmm. it came true. You know, thank yeah, God. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But um, anyway, I became comfortable. I became Americanized. I started working my way up. I was an entrepreneur. I was working my way up the corporate ladder. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm making decent money, more money than anybody in my family has ever made at this right, point, right? right, right. Um, but I do remember getting up to that point. Like, I remember having to kick out, like, my mortgage. You know, like, okay, it's due on the 1st, but I'm kicking it to the 15th because I'm going to get another payday by then. Right, right. Um, you know, uh, okay, I got these bills. Well, I'm not paying them until it actually says... Disconnection notice, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just like every other American, like I went through all that uh, paycheck to paycheck, you know, type of lifestyle mm -hmm. um, where my 
in your 20s. In my 20s, yeah. where my vacations were California. Mm-hmm. Hey, guys, I saved up a few hundred bucks. We're driving to Cali. <laughs> that was my vacations, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Compared to now, it's like, you know, um, Patrick got to see me. I mean, I just, yeah. you know, I, I gave my family the world. You know, I don't go yeah. cheap on my family. So uh, totally different lifestyle back then. So this is exactly what pushed me back into that immigrant uh, mindset, mm-hmm. right? I actually was up for a promotion that I had worked for, worked towards for four years. Mm-hmm. I was I was the guy that was gonna get it. I was the guy that was I was the ultimate yes man in, in my company, in that company, not my company, that company. Hey, we need you to go to Seattle during Christmas. Yes, sir. Hey, I know it's Thanksgiving, but I need you to go to California and uh, oversee this district. Got it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, anything that they said, I was the ultimate yes man. Mm-hmm. And when it was time for me to actually get that uh, get get that promotion, where I, w- I was going to go from making seventy thousand a year to making one hundred ten thousand a year, mm-hmm. right? I uh, they're like, okay, Carlos, we know that you've been working towards this promotion for four years. Right. You're the only person that uh, that is literally you know equipped mm-hmm. uh, to to handle this position. Mm-hmm. But uh, we do have to, you know for for political sakes, right? Mm-hmm. For political sakes, we do need to interview three other people. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, this isn't. I didn't, you know, this isn't, this doesn't sound good. Right. It's not smelling right, right? Right. But I said, okay, sounds good, right? They're like, no, no, don't worry. They haven't worked towards this. You have. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, um, sure enough, the guy that was leaving mm-hmm. gave it to the guy that he used to travel with. So I was ranked number one in this company. He was right. ranked, the other guy that got the position was ranked 17th. And I, I man, like, they, they did me pretty bad, mm-hmm. right? And I was completely like, man, like when I tell you that I went into like a, a depression, like I went into a depression and they're like, hey, hey, we're so sorry. I know this didn't work out. I'm, you know, I'm like, what? <laughs> right. I've given yeah, yeah. you guys years. Yeah. Take two weeks off, paid, you know, leave, paid leave absence. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And they were just trying to give me some carries yeah, at yeah, that yeah. point. Right. Yeah, yeah. So how old are you at this stage? Uh, I'm about 26, okay, 26 cool. years old. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I go uh, when I tell you that I watched uh, I watched six or seven seasons of Game of Thrones in <laughs> in two weeks. Yeah, you know, yeah. like that's the only thing that kept me alive. I believe, right? Like yeah. my my wife was like really worried. Like, mm-hmm. hey, you're not coming out of the room. What's going on? Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, man. Like, imagine working towards something and someone just sweeps the world from under your feet. Right. 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 That's exactly what happened to me. But that did something to me. Like, what, year, what year was this? Uh, this was in uh, 2012, mm-hmm. and. You know, at that point, I, I went back to that immigrant mentality, that immigrant mindset. Like, man, something sparked inside me. I, I can't explain. But, you know, God started talking to me then again. Like, God was like, hey, I got something better for you. That's why this didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Just trust me, mm-hmm. right? You just trust me. And I was having, my, I, was, I was such in a, a low point in my life where I was having a tough time, mm-hmm. right? And, and what always helped me was my faith. My mm-hmm. faith in God always helped me. Mm-hmm. That's how I made it through all the all those you know that turmoil and trials mm-hmm. and tribulations. So, so were you were you spiritual at that time? Very, or was, I was I was I was I've always been I've always been spiritual. My, so my, you didn't you didn't engage in like smoking and drinking and all this. No, stuff, right? You were with your childhood sweetheart. You were yeah. sober. You had so you never had those sorts of distractions or anything pulling at your attention. Not no, absolutely not. No, what, abs- what what made you consciously not do those things? Uh, you know, I think that I I was always a little different from my friends. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my little brother, uh, he, he actually was the rebel. He was the rebel. Oh uh, yeah. He yeah, was, yeah. cause you know, he had big brother, right? So yeah, I was yeah. big brother. I was responsible, yeah, you know, yeah. responsible. Kind of sober him up, take care of him. I was responsible yeah, yeah. brother, right? He yeah. was like, Oh, he, he's responsible. I don't have to be right. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I was always a little different, you know, yeah. I was, I was not definitely, he was the popular and I love him to death, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, he was the popular guy among the friends because he would, you know, do, cool hey, we're partying, stuff, we're drinking, yeah. we're smoking, great. And me, I'm like, no, oh, I got to get up tomorrow. You see what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. a little different, right? And then um, your your childhood sweetheart talks to me about that. Um, I met her when I was uh, 17 years old uh, playing softball uh, mm-hmm. for the uh, city of Phoenix Parks and Recreation. Um, you know, something just magnetically or energetically attracted me to her. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, to this day, man, I'm still... I'm still pretty crazy in love with her Mm -hmm. to this day like you know it's funny uh i was actually on the treadmill this morning and i'm just i was like feeling this emotion of gratitude towards her and my children Mm -hmm. right i'm like man i freaking i can't believe i still love her this much right like i still love her so much you know i still love her like i'm I'm in love with her still Mm -hmm. to this day and uh i was feeling a lot of gratitude this morning uh towards her and me because we just came back from this 
six, seven day vacation in Atlanta, right? Mm -hmm. And I was just feeling so grateful for my family. Uh, that was this morning. Uh, but circling back around to, yeah. right? Uh, imagine a, a phoenix like rising from the ashes at this point, right? Right. I, I just get up, man, and my everything shifted. I go back into that. Uh, I go back and, and talk to the vice president, and I say, hey. Um, you know, I know that I've been giving you guys 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to start another venture, and I can only give you 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Because when I get out at 3 p.m., I'm going to work on my business. That, right. They're like, what? You know, they they're, they didn't believe me. They're like, yeah. you're not, you know, whatever, right? Like, like you're not, you being the yes man and all that. Is that like, yeah, sure. Like, oh, are you doing this because we screwed you out of, you know, right, out right, of position? Right. Yeah. Um, so they didn't believe me, and they're like, oh, you're serious? I said, absolutely. So if I have to... If this doesn't work for you guys, I totally understand. Um, I'll just have to find a place that will make it work for me, mm -hmm. right? And sure thing, like, okay, well, we'll, we'll do 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday with for you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they were so discouraging. They're like, but, you know, more than likely that's not going to work. So, you know, don't don't put all your eggs in that basket. Like, you know, people yeah, are just yeah, so yeah. – people like to project their own, like, insecurities on you, right? Yeah. So uh, sure thing, man. I didn't have – at this point, I you know, I, I kind of – I had a mortgage. I had a few cars and things like that. So – I didn't have a lot of money. I was kind of broke, to be honest with you. I was, I was, you know. Were you over leveraged at that? I was point? over. I was for sure over over leveraged. And and did you do that to kind of motivate yourself to make more money, or was it just a series of bad habits, or what? With or being over leveraged. Yeah. Um, like were you were you buying? I I, 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 didn't, I just didn't have the uh, the financial education. Yeah. I I, I wasn't. Yeah. I. I like were you were you like getting cars you couldn't afford and renting a place um, you couldn't get I, or so my how did mortgage, you get into the over leverage? Again? My uh, I've always been a, a crazy spender, right? <laughs> I've, I've never because I've never valued money, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I never looked at money like, oh, you yeah, know, yeah. I, man. Like I've always looked at money like whatever, you yeah. know. It's just like it's a vehicle of exchange. Yeah. Exactly. I, all my life, by the way, all my life I've looked at money that way. Even mm -hmm. though I was extremely poor, mm -hmm. I never like money wasn't like the top of my priority. You know, it, it never was. Like I never used to like die over money or lust lust it. You know. Right. So. I think that's why I got myself in trouble because, mm -hmm. you know, I had a, a BMW uh, mm -hmm. 6 Series, you know, my wife had like a 2008 Nissan Rogue, I'm nothing crazy, yeah, you yeah. know, this, the year was 2012, so, yeah. um, you know, I, we had a house, a mortgage of like 12, 1300 bucks at that point, you mm -hmm. know, so I, I just, you know, I, I had bad, bad, bad habits, like you said, mm -hmm. you know, bad, I just wasn't very good with finances at that mm -hmm. point, and mo a lot of people that are in middle class aren't, that's why we live paycheck to paycheck, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, I didn't have enough money to really pay a mentor, pay a coach, um, you know, or get any type of education in the game of real estate. Mm -hmm. But I, I picked up, I bought this book for $10 mm -hmm. and it, it talked about wholesaling real estate. And like, what is wholesaling, right? Literally flipping houses with little to no money out of your pocket. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds like a scam, mm -hmm. but I bought this office in December of 2009, wholesaling real estate. Mm -hmm. That's how I bought this office, right? 2009. Uh, sorry, 2019. Gotcha. Apologize. Yeah, yeah. December of 2019, I bought this office, multi-million dollar office, with wholesaling real estate. Mm -hmm. So anybody out there that thinks wholesaling is a scam, it's absolutely not a scam, mm -hmm. right? I pick up this pick up this book. I didn't have a lot of money, so what I started doing was I started. Uh, How old are you? Uh, I'm about 29 at this point. So 29, you get into wholesaling real yep. estate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I start. I, I'm sorry. I start educating, educating myself right. in the game of real estate, uh, wholesaling real estate. Mm -hmm. Because I, I I didn't have you know I didn't have I didn't have the, the I didn't have uh, credit I didn't have uh, money mm -hmm. I don't come from a rich family I don't have rich friends so mm -hmm. I kind of just had to figure this out on my own. Yeah, and you didn't want to be an agent. You don't you couldn't be no. an investor because you didn't have capital. Yep. So it was the easiest barrier to entry. Absolutely. In real estate. Absolutely. And, and what is wholesaling real estate for people who are you know listening to this and maybe clueless? Okay. What would be your best simple you know one paragraph breakdown, if you will, of what uh, exactly it means to wholesale real estate? Literally. Finding off-market discounted properties from motivated, distressed sellers, mm -hmm. putting that property under contract, mm -hmm. right? You're kind of the middle person. Mm -hmm. You're the you're kind of like the bird dog, mm -hmm. or the, the you, you get a finder's fee. Right. You find that property. You find a, a end buyer, a fix and flipper who's actually has the money mm -hmm. and the resources to to fi fix that property. Mm -hmm. You assign the interest of that property. To this person, and you make a big old fee in the middle. Uh, it's called an assignment fee, mm -hmm. and those assignment fees are anywhere from five all the way to 100, 200 k. Mm -hmm. So, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the assignment fees that I've been able to have back in the days, right? Yeah. So uh, that's who I was. I was the middle guy. So all you need to be a, a wholesaler is hustle. 
Mm-hmm. Like you got to be resourceful, you got to be creative, mm-hmm. and you got to have a lot of hustle. Mm-hmm. And that's what I had because I went back into my immigrant mindset. Right. So, so you use that to kind of fuel your ability to both find off market properties that would be hot and also find end buyers that could buy those properties. You get paid as the middleman in the middle. Boom. Who, who introduced you to it, or was it a book that, that it was a book. planted the seed? It was uh, a, a gentleman named Nick Ruiz. Uh, he's no longer uh, in the game. He's no longer educating or anything like that. Uh, it's funny. Uh, it's funny how the world turns, right? I had him. I had him speak at my event in uh, February 2018. Wow, that's I threw, crazy. I threw an event. Uh, I threw an event at five thousand dollars per seat, uh-huh. and he was a guest speaker at my event. Wow, what did that feel like for you to think that you were one day? We became a great friends, and you know your your heroes become your Homies. I don't know your right, your friends, right? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, it was a beautiful thing, man. It was one of the a milestone for me for sure. Wow. And then, okay, so 29, you get into wholesaling real estate. What happens at work? Do you end up leaving there once you get your first deal? I, I, uh, I got into wholesaling in 2014. Okay. 2014 is when I got into wholesaling. So how long between educating yourself in real estate to actually your first deal? Six months. And what was your first deal? Like, did you mess it up? Did you? I'll tell you yeah. my, my first, because everybody everybody will always remember their first deal. <laughs> Right. And, I, and people used to tell me that, and I, I didn't believe it, and now I do. Yeah. I've done over a thousand deals, by the way, and mm-hmm. I still remember. I don't remember the last deal we did, but I remember. <laughs> but I remember my yeah. first deal. You remember the check, though? <laughs> I, I remember the last. No, actually, I don't even remember the. Really? Okay, so we have a few big projects that we're gonna right. make some good money. Like I got a property in Berkeley. We'll make five hundred, five hundred, six hundred thousand net. Yeah. That's a property in Berkeley that we're flipping now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we bought eight properties yesterday. Three of them were flipping. Five of them were holding. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll make a good six figures out of that. Uh, and then we just cashed out on a, ch- uh, uh, a property yesterday uh, here in Phoenix, and we made 107,000. So yeah, I do remember some. Yeah. Some of the, you know, some, I, yeah. I remember the bigger deals, not the smaller deals. Right. But I will always remember this deal, and that deal only made me five thousand dollars. But it was mm-hmm. the first deal, and the way that I got it was six months. And my wife, uh, at that time, she wasn't my wife; she was my fiance. She wrote 2,400 handwritten bannetons for me. She would write bannetons on Wednesdays. Wow. And I would put them out on Fridays. And guess what? Friday nights at 11 p.m., nobody wanted to go with me. None of my friends that see me now are like, dude, holy yeah. smokes, right? Yeah. None of them wanted to even. I, I used to offer people like $50. Like, hey, man, can you just drive me around? Yeah, come walk with me. And keep, it, keep me company. Just, ex- yeah, yeah. just drive me around so I can yeah. jump out the passenger seat <laughs> and put these bandit signs in all four corners. Right. I'll pay you 50 bucks. Yeah. Nah, man, I'm going to sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 11 to 2? 11 p.m. to 2 a.m.? No, thank you. Yeah. That, that was my life for six months until I landed my first deal. Mm-hmm. I landed my first deal. Uh, it was a Hispanic lady. So did you end up going solo or you went with your, your who's now your wife at that time? No, I, it was just me. She solo. was just, no, yeah. she had to take care of my daughter at that right, time. Right. So, you know, I was like, I was the only one going out there and Hustling. putting this, this bandit side. Yeah. So um, I landed my first deal. We made $5,000. I, I, I remember exactly this lady. She was a landlord, uh, uh, a disgruntled landlord in West Phoenix. And it took me a lot. I I didn't know how to run comparables, so I didn't know how like I didn't know how to determine the the, the value of the property. I didn't know how yeah. to run a MAO, which is a maximum allowed offer. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to run you know uh, rehab cost. I didn't have an LLC. I mean, I didn't have all. I, brother, yeah. when I tell you that I was just failing forward, mm-hmm. I, I definitely was. This is literally the epitome of earning while you're learning, right? Yeah, taking so, perfect action. I, I didn't know anything, but I managed to get this this lady to sign this deal. Mm. I managed to find a guy named Brian Ponciano to, to buy this deal. I made $5,000. And then what I did was I, I took that $5,000 and I, I did a $2,500 mail, direct mail campaign. Mm-hmm. I made $60,000 on my first direct mail campaign. Then I did another $2,500 mail campaign. I made $30,000. Now I have $90,000. Mm-hmm. Then I put uh, $7,500 into pay-per-click, and I had my first uh, six-figure month in July of 2016, $123,000. $123, mm-hmm. Now, now fast forward to today, $123,000 weren't even covering my expenses, mm-hmm. my monthly expenses here, of course, yeah, yeah. Uh, my operation now. But $123,000 at that time was like hitting the lot. It was like $100 million at that absolutely. time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And at what point did you say, like, okay, I'm gonna go all in on this? Was it after your first deal, or did you decide before? Did, like, when did you? Quit? When I started putting out bandit signs. So you quit your job and then did? The, oh, did oh, you, oh, 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 okay. Well, of, I yeah. no, I, I gave myself. I said, hey, uh, I'm gonna have my job mm-hmm. and 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 you know my entrepreneurship uh, venture here uh, for no more than a year. Mm-hmm. No so more you than set a year. date. Yes, I did. Yes. As soon as I. You know, have four months of reserves, 
and I have a couple deals in the pipeline, I'm quitting. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. yeah. So literally your first deal, you make 5K. You have no idea what you're doing. Nope. From that, you take the 5K. Very important lesson here. You reinvest, reinvest. it back into the business. How scary was it to reinvest that 2,500? Uh, brother, you hit, you hit it right on, yeah. the, on the head. Um, a lot of conversations with your wife, huh? Should I? Should you, I not? Right? That's, you know, one of my, one of, I believe that what's made us one of the top, like, real estate, like, private real estate investment companies in the country mm -hmm. is that we have a very high tolerance for risk. Mm -hmm. At that point, um, I used to look at marketing as an expense and not an investment. Mm -hmm. um, I figured that out as soon as I, uh, as soon as I, I spent that 20, it took, you're right, it took every ounce of me. I had to overcome a lot of <laughs> voices and a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. To dump that twenty five hundred dollars into the marketing campaign, but when I saw sixty k, mm -hmm. right, I'm like, well, let's do that again. How did that sixty k come about? Because I know there's people listening, and they go, okay, cool. So you put out twenty five hundred dollars. Twenty five hundred, twenty five hundred dollars worth of direct mail, mail campaigns. Meaning, mail campaign. meaning people were mailed stuff in their mail. I sent out uh, thousands and thousands of letters mm -hmm. to specifically West Phoenix, because I wanted to target um, kind of the West Phoenix at that time were. The, the lower entry level, you know, sure. they weren't like Paradise Valley. Sure. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to go for what I know. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, plus I'm Mexican. I'm Hispanic. Uh, they're Hispanic. Uh, they're going to want to do business with me. Right. Right. And sure thing. Uh, I did about four, four deals from, from that campaign mm -hmm. and it turned into uh, $60,000 so in about, assignment fees. So it was about 10, 15, 20 K dealers. Uh, I don't remember what my average deal size, my average assignment fee was, but it was four deals, 60, $60,000. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're right. Wow. So then from there you go, holy shit, this is possible now. Yep. And then and then where does it start blowing up? You have that 100k a month and mm -hmm. then when do you just kind of go all in start hiring um, people? How does that, that That's when that's when when I made when I made that six figure, when I made that when I had that six figure month in uh in July of 2016, I hired my first acquisition guy. Mm -hmm. I uh increased my marketing budget. Mm -hmm. I uh I uh actually uh, have access to uh better systems, better mm -hmm. processes, more resources, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, and that's when we started really blowing up. Now, what advice? And I, I want to get into wholesaling real estate advice because I know there's a lot of people who are you know really getting interested in it now. Especially we've seen what happens in the economy. If you want to take control of your future, you know real estate is one of the best um, wealth building tools, but they don't know how to get into it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people talk about wholesale real estate. We'll get into that. But I want to kind of retract back a little bit uh, and talk about your relationship um, with your now wife. Uh, you said you guys met at 17 playing softball. How crucial to your success now would you say having that significant other along the journey was for you i, I definitely wouldn't have been able to do it without her like we wouldn't be sitting at this table no, sir so no. she so on those lonely nights where you're figuring out what do i do she was the one riding the car Man, she, she was never the one helping you take an initiative i got extremely lucky yeah because she never she never doubted me and she she always used to tell me like like i know you're gonna i know you're gonna do something great i know you're gonna be someone great mm -hmm. like she always used to tell me that you know and uh Man, she believed in me more than I even believed in myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I love um, that. And, I, and the reason I ask is because I hear that so often. So yeah. often people say yeah. that. And sometimes you forget or you take it for granted. We do. In it. We do. We do. Yeah. Yeah. So did you, I want to ask, and, and feel free to be honest here. Did you ask her to handwrite those cards or did she take the initiative to handwrite those cards? She took the initiative. Yeah. To Because um, I couldn't afford pre-printed signs. <laughs> so so she she's, like, she's like, okay, well, uh uh, my uh, at the time, my uh, brother-in-law Adrian, mm -hmm. you know, he has a he has a bag of markers, <laughs> right? He has yeah. a bag of markers. Resourcefulness is the ultimate yeah. resource, right? She yeah. she said that she's like, well, he has a bag of markers. If you can just get those signs cheap enough, I'll write them for you. Mm -hmm. And I actually uh, I'll show you pictures of not only her but even my daughter, who's now eight at that time, kind of just messing around and screaming. Uh -huh. you know yeah, I mean? yeah, so yeah. it was a. It was it was a it was a family mm -hmm. uh, it, it was it was a family push for sure. And and what tidbits or pieces of advice would you give for entrepreneurs out there? And I guess really even non entrepreneurs, men, women, um, who are interested in finding significant other. What are important things that you find have kind of allowed you guys to have a thriving relationship versus most out there? And I'm sure you've seen it, right? Entrepreneurs have the highest divorce rate in the world. Um, what are some of the key common denominators you find that made the relationship work and thrive? Uh, versus maybe what you've seen of relationships that don't work out or the wrong significant. There are so many components that make up a, you know, because as you can see, I'm, I'm married to, you know, my high school sweetheart and I've been with her for, you won't believe this. Uh, I asked her out August 19th, 2001. Mm. Right. Almost 20 We're, years now. That's wow. what I'm saying. So, yeah. um, 
uh, some of the things that some of the components that I, you know, it's not everybody always thinks like they watch these movies and they think that's going to be they're, they're going to have some kind of Hollywood love. Right. <laughs> right. That's not existent. You know, right. I, I'm still I'm still in love with my wife. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, it's but, probably even better in a certain regard, though, right? Yeah, that stuff's not real. Mm-hmm. You know, that the, the stuff they see, yeah, yeah. like, you know, if, I'm sure everybody here has watched The Notebook, right? right. Like, yeah, I mean, that's, it, there's one in a million stories that are like that, right? Mm-hmm. But especially nowadays, it's yeah. very rare, right? And, and I think what's interesting, too, kind of like um, music videos, right? A music video is three, four minutes. Uh, if that music video lasted a long time, you'd get sick of it, right? Same thing sure. with a movie. It's easy to capture a fantasy of something for two hours, but you can't sustain that for no. life. But the beauty is that actually it could be even greater and even richer experience, right? Because the lows might be lower, but the highs are even higher, right? And that connection is irreplaceable. Um, what are some things that you would advise people to look for, though, qualities-wise, whether it's men or women, in a significant other versus red flags? Because I'm sure you've seen it, whether it be your office, your staff, your team, um, clients you've had, right? You work with distressed properties. I can't imagine that you haven't come across a, you know, um, some crazy stories of, you know, things that haven't worked out. But for people listening around the world right now, what advice would you give them? You know, I believe that a successful relationship Mm -hmm. has to have a certain set of principles, Mm -hmm. right? Love being one of them. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, that's mostly, you know, a a big factor. But, Mm -hmm. you know, trust, interdependence, communication, Mm -hmm. support, right? Those things those those things matter mm-hmm. like those things matter and what like you know interdependence right mm-hmm. she has her life i have my life and then we have our life together mm-hmm. you know uh trust nowadays that's a very thing very hard difficult thing to to find especially now yeah right you have to remember Swipe culture yeah. oh my goodness yeah right you got only fans or i think it's called only fans right <laughs> yeah, yeah you got <laughs> you got instagram and then you i mean you got it, it's the society is totally different now mm-hmm. But I believe that, you know, if those are some of the principles that people should look for in, mm-hmm. in another person, mm-hmm. you know, trust, support, communication is key. Mm-hmm. You know, I know you and I have had a conversation about communication. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Men and women are from two different planets. Right. Yeah. Right. The way that we commit, the, the way that you and I can communicate mm-hmm. more than likely will not work with our significant others. Right. And the way that they communicate with other women are not the way that they can communicate with us. So that's a big thing. Learning how to, you know, I know there's a book out there, which I haven't read. It's called the five love languages, right? right. I haven't read that book. I should, but <laughs> right. I should, yeah. you know, uh, but that, that's a real thing. It's right. like learning how to communicate with each other, approach mm-hmm. each other, right. Mm-hmm. And coexist with each other and support each other and believe, believe and encourage and empower each other mm-hmm. those things matter a lot and I, and those that that right there mm-hmm. is the foundation to a very like fruitful healthy long-term relationship and how do you think people can work on their communication skills whether life business relationships i mean i i know that's so important how important do you feel communication is and what advice do you have for people to enhance the quality of their communication i, I don't think now i think nowadays like mm-hmm. people don't take the time to communicate yeah or work on it they don't yeah, yeah. what was the last time that you know somebody out there sat down and said, you know, now it's like they'll have blow ups or disagreements. Mm -hmm. Right. When was the last time they actually sit down and say, Hey babe, can I talk to you for a second? Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. And then literally active listening, Mm -hmm. you know, like, Hey, um, listen, I know that I totally came off the wrong way and I apologize for that. Mm -hmm. Um, please, you know, you know, grant me these couple minutes so I can understand where you were coming from. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll express how I felt. You see, yeah, people yeah. don't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it they don't do that mind. anymore. It blows my mind. Yeah. yeah. And the thing I always tell people is like, when you argue, it's not very productive, because say someone's upset, whether in life or business relationships, whatever, is say you're communicating with someone and you're upset about something. Well, if that person's not receptive, the odds of you venting about a situation and, and them going, you know what? Thank you for communicating that. I'm so sorry. I'm going to change my behavior and really not going to happen. It's not going to happen at all. Yeah, you know, yeah, especially yeah. if your significant other is like pissed off at you for something. Yeah. But if you don't have that, what's what's the opposite? Chaos. By default, Absolutely. you're living in chaos. Absolutely. So it's integral. But I agree with you. It's not common. Our yeah. fights now, mm-hmm. or I, I don't even call them fights. Yeah. Our disagreements. Spirited debates. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Or <laughs> like. Yeah. Hey, you didn't take out the trash, and I asked you to do that. Mm-hmm. Right. Hey, babe. That laundry ain't gonna fold itself, right? You know, those are our <laughs> yeah, yeah. disagreements now, right? Yeah. I'll give you our our last disagreement. I'll tell you where how it went. Mm-hmm. She comes in. Uh, I'm in the laundry room. I'm grabbing some clothes, and she says, 
did you not take off your shoes when you came in? Because that's a big thing for her is like, because we have wooden floor. Right. And if I go in the backyard, right, in the house, she gets, um, uh, our house gets clean twice a week. Um, she has people that come and clean it. Right. So those are the only, it's, it's so crazy, but the day <laughs> of or the next day, it's like, Everything has to be clean because I just, <laughs> I just, you know, we just paid for it to be clean. Right. So sure thing. Uh, hey, did you not take off your? And, and at, at this point, I was under, I was overwhelmed with a, a lot of things, and and I kind of just kind of erupted. Not, and I, sure. I didn't bash, I didn't lash sure. out and like say bad words or anything. Sure, sure. I was just like, come on, are you serious? Right? Like, great. Yeah, like, I paid like, for this shit. Yeah, 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 I didn't yeah, say yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, I don't no, want to say that, but, but I, I get, get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're right. So <laughs> you're right. So she just walks away from me. She yeah. walks to the master bedroom. Yeah. And I caught myself right there, and, mm -hmm. and I said, "Wait a minute!" I said, don't, don't, "Don't be a coward. Mm -hmm. Just because you're overwhelmed at work doesn't mean you got to explode on your wife." Mm -hmm. So I follow her. I go to the master bedroom, and I say, "Hey, communication. Mm -hmm. Hey, babe, can I talk to you for a second? Mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, at this point, she's kind of pissed off at me because I exploded, right? Right. And she's like, "She's like, what, Carlos?" And I said, "Hey, you know what, man? I'm so sorry. I, I'm a, I'm overwhelmed, and and I I." I exploded on you, and, mm. and you're not at fault by any means. That's on me. Mm. I'm sorry. You know, I, I apologize. You know, what I got going on at work should have nothing to do with what I have going on here at home with you and the girls. Mm. So there. We got through that. I mean, uh, we got through that disagreement in a matter of less than five minutes. Yeah. And, and the fact that you actually approached it that way and dropped your ego as a man. Always. Is something to be said about that. And the fact that she was receptive to that. Right? Yes. Because, like you said, the average That's where the person, love comes in. Exactly. That's where it grows. Yeah. Yes. Because most people either wouldn't do one or both of those, right? Someone wouldn't lower their ego to say that, or someone wouldn't humble themselves to hear it and respond to it and move on. Yes. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Okay, now, going back to um, real estate, mm -hmm. right, wholesaling, what advice do you have for people who are maybe struggling to get their first deal? Because reality is a lot of people may be listening to this, and you know, no matter where they you know, live in the country or the world or whatever, there's opportunities in real estate everywhere. So... Talk to me on what advice would you give for people who are just starting in the business or maybe want to get into wholesaling real estate? Obviously, you know, getting mentorship and learning from people who've done it is crucial. Um, but talk to me about the struggle, because I'm sure you've seen it, right? You've yeah. helped thousands of people at this stage, I'm sure. Um, what it, mindset, what advice would you give to people who are struggling to get their first deal or kind of get some success or find momentum in it when it feels like the walls might be kind of caving in on them? Well... You know, there, there's a lot of things that go into play. One is people have to make the decision of wanting something different, wanting something more for their lives, mm -hmm. right? That's like number one. Mm -hmm. And I believe that everybody in this room at one point has made that decision or mm -hmm. will make that decision. Yeah. So you got to make a decision, right? Once you make that decision, you have to commit. Mm -hmm. You have to be committed. Commitment, like we were discussing earlier, it, it's not a motivational thing. Mm -hmm. You know, commitment is... I'm going to do this no matter what. Mm -hmm. That's commitment, mm -hmm. right? It's like a yeah. promise you make to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing that I, I you know, you, you got you to gotta make the necessary sacrifices. Everybody wants the glory, mm -hmm. but nobody wants, you know, the struggle, mm -hmm. right? Everybody wants to be a man, millionaire, but nobody wants to grind. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to hustle. Nobody wants to fail. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to uh, get, you know, no one wants people to say, no, get out of my face, you know? Mm -hmm. People aren't willing to make the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're not willing. Yeah, I want to be a millionaire, but I don't want to sacrifice time with my friends. Mm -hmm. I want to be a mil millionaire, but I don't want to sacrifice my hobbies. Mm -hmm. I want to be a mil millionaire, but I don't want to sacrifice that great show I have going on on Netflix. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. They don't want to make those sacrifices, right? Mm -hmm. So vision, commitment, sacrifice, work ethic. Name, Brother, I know for a fact that you've, You've interviewed hundreds mm -hmm. of very successful people. Mm -hmm. Name one that didn't have work ethic. Oh, yeah. Every single one. Yeah. Okay. And so un unreasonable work ethic. Unreasonable work to where, ethic. To where they had every justified reason to stop and still proceeded. There you go. Yeah. Work ethic. And the last thing is one of the most important things mm -hmm. is perseverance. Mm -hmm. Don't quit. Mm -hmm. Don't quit. Right. Do not quit. A lot. Of, how many people do you know? Uh, not the successful ones that you've right. interviewed, right? And the ones that have made it to your show. Yeah. But how many people have you known in your life that that quit? Mm -hmm. They quit most, when most. Yeah. Well, according to statistics, ninety-seven percent, right? Right. So, ninety-seven percent of people quit. They quit, and it's almost like that three that that book, Three Feet from Gold, right? Sometimes right. they quit right when they're about to get that deal, you mm -hmm. know, right when they're about to score, you know, score mm -hmm. that big payday, right? Mm -hmm. They quit. So that's another thing. And, and, and a couple of things that I want people to know out there is 
analysis paralysis, that's a huge thing. Mm -hmm. People spend so much time analyzing, right, all the, the content and, and watching your podcast and watching Gary Vee's podcast and all these other, like, mm -hmm. all this content they're consuming and they just become paralyzed. Right. Right? They don't take enough action, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that's, one thing that I, yeah. that's one thing that I believe in is take massive action. You know, what I did was, you know, I, my, my moves were like rough draft moves. <laughs> I didn't have an LLC. I didn't know how to come properties. I didn't know how to talk to sellers. I didn't even know how to open up escrow with the title agency. Like, I didn't know these things, but I was just so committed to this that I just made rough draft moves. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that I want people out there. Hey, you, you don't have to have it all figured out. Mm -hmm. Just move forward, move mm -hmm. forward, fail forward, fail forward. I promise if you don't quit, this will work out for you. Mm -hmm. So that's that's some advice that I want to give people yeah. out there. Imperfect action. Take um, more imperfect action. Beautiful. Yeah. And then at what point do you feel like um, you kind of hit a momentum with it to where you're like, okay, I get this stuff. I want to start teaching it. What, what was the, the transition? Was it Did somebody come to you and say, Show me how to do that, or they saw the chat. No, I, I, I know. I, I have, I have the uh, uh, first time. By the way, first time somebody ever ever asks me that. Yeah. But I know exactly when this happened. Mm -hmm. It was the year 2018. So and I'll tell you how it happened. All right. So, the way that I've made uh, one of my mentees asked me because he, you know, a lot of my mentees are now coaches across the country. Right. And uh, uh, a gentleman out of San Antonio asked me. Hey, man, I, I really want to explode. I really want to grow my brand the way you've grown the, your brand in this industry and mm -hmm. in, in real estate community. Mm -hmm. How did you do it? And, and I was like, I, I actually paused for like a minute or two. And I'm like, man, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, it's not all the money I made. Mm -hmm. It's not all the houses that I flipped. I said, it's all the people that I've been able to help build seven figure operations across the country. Mm -hmm. That's how I made a name for myself in this industry. So if it wasn't for education, I don't think I would have the name because there's a bunch of people out there that flip a bunch of houses, right? But there's not a bunch of people out there that help other people create seven figure companies, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I made my name. Thank God. Mm -hmm. So back to the education question. I went to an event in San Francisco, California. It was called seven figure flippers. Mm -hmm. I went there. I paid $3,000 to, to be there. Mm -hmm. And it was a roundtable mastermind. And I'm hearing all these people and what they're doing. And, and I'm like, holy smokes. I've, 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 at this point, I've already spent a few million dollars in just marketing, right? Yeah. I'm like, wow. I, I do way more marketing than these folks. <laughs> I, make, I, I flip way more houses than these people. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I'm already flipping. I'm wholesaling, I'm wholesaling nationally. Mm -hmm. And how many, how many properties are you flipping a year at that stage? Anywhere between probably three to four hundred, three to four hundred properties mm -hmm. whole, wholesale. It yeah. wasn't even. I didn't launch my full like fix and flip operation till uh, uh, March of 2020. Mm -hmm. and, and you know that right there when I added that department to this to to my organization, mm -hmm. I mean it's. I'm telling you, it's a whole different ballgame. Once you add fixing and flipping, right? Mm -hmm. I was taking all that capital. I was. I mean, I was making like what? Do you, what's that old saying? Uh, hand over fist. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Hand over fist. Right. Yeah, making money. Hand Wholesaling. Over. I was making wholesale wholesale money. Hand over fist, and that's how I was able to actually either buy other companies in other sectors, mm -hmm. right, other industries, uh, or create or build other companies with all the money that I was making. I'm like, well, I guess I got all this money. What do I do? You know what? Let me start creating all these other companies mm -hmm. or buying all these other companies. Right. Mm -hmm. Bought a solar company. Bought a medical company. Mm -hmm. I bought all these other companies with the liquid I was getting. How and much? I bought this building. How much did you know about those uh, companies when you bought them? I strategically actually went, I strategically partnered up in those companies. So what I did was with the Google, I'm sorry, with the digital marketing agency, I grabbed the guy that worked 10 years in Google, one of the top consultants. Hey, you want to be my partner? I got the capital, right? I got the capital. And I, got uh, yeah. the, you know, I got the, I got the capital. I got exactly. the influence. Mm -hmm. We'll get, you know, that company already makes uh, seven figures a year. Right. Uh, uh, same thing with uh, the so solar you, solar company. So, so you you vertically integrated everything you want to do, but you started with the order of generating cash flow, yep. capital with that, and then that opened up other doors to hire the best. Literally, so you don't yes. waste time with yes, yeah, yeah, B players. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so when I went to mm -hmm. that seven figure flipper uh, mastermind, mm -hmm. I came back with a really sour taste in my mouth. I'm mm -hmm. like, wait, I just paid three k, and I, I was like the biggest dog there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I'm like the biggest dog there. So I'm like, why don't I throw my own event? Mm -hmm. Like what's stopping me from the? Okay, boom, momentum. I throw it. Uh, February of, uh, I'm sorry, June of 2018. I charge five thousand dollars per seat. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm gonna. I spent millions of dollars on R and D, right? Mm -hmm. Research and development. 
I've spent millions of dollars on like, you know, figuring all this out, you know, from personnel to systems to processes to marketing. I'm going to throw this event and charge $5,000 per seat. Mm -hmm. We sold 82, uh, 82 seats mm -hmm. at $5,000. Did you run ads to it or did you do it off? Organic. All organic. All organic. Just, uh, Instagram. Yeah. All Instagram. Wow. Not even Facebook. How important has Instagram growth been to your business? Instagram has definitely made me millions and millions and millions of dollars for sure. Mm -hmm. Just being on Instagram. And uh, now you have to remember, though, if you go if you go into my Instagram profile, I've been dropping Instagram content since 2013. Mm -hmm. But nobody gives a sh can I Can I curse yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Nobody gives a shit about the content you're dropping until you're successful. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Like nobody gave a crap of anything that I had to say until I started pulling up in Rolls Royces and you know what I mean? Like, Showing checks or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that, oh, okay. Well, I guess I'll pay some attention to what it, this guy has. <laughs> you see, isn't that crazy right, the right. way that works, right? Yeah, yeah. Nobody cares about you until you're successful, right? Yeah. So Muhammad Ali said that. He said some of the greatest um, churches are in some of the poorest cities in the world. But unless it's big and grandiose, you know, people are in the right neighborhood or you yeah, know, with yeah, the yeah. right you know, the right tithers, right? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so I went back through my first event. Uh, it was incredible. Uh, we did really good. And I don't forget the fact that we did, you know, a couple hundred thousand, like on the front end, mm -hmm. you know, all these people were like, we're some of the top investors in the country. They're like, Oh my God, we're blown away. Mm -hmm. Right. So then I throw another event. Uh, so June and then I throw another event, September of 2018, same thing. Right. Then finally in 2019, I start, I, I'm like, I'm not even offering mentorship because I'm only doing I'm only doing two events a year at this point. Right, right. Right. I'm just like, I'm doing this just to like make a little bit of money and literally teach a bunch of people like high level, you know, real estate education, right? Um, so then boom, uh 2019 comes around. I'm like, okay, guys, I'm I'm offering mentorship at this point, and that gets crazy. Mm -hmm. Like that gets really crazy. So I started educating and helping people build their seven-figure companies. And by the way, for people out there, I didn't start doing all these things until my my real estate operation was completely automated and delegated. Mm -hmm. That's very important for people out there. Do not start edu. Well, uh, a lot of people out there these days yeah. they're educating with the right. Yeah. They take a picture in front of a Lambo that they rented or something, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, and then they're like, "Oh, I'm an educator now. I'm an influencer, yeah. right?" Not me. I, I'm a brick and mortar kind of guy, mm -hmm. and I didn't start educating until I can actually. I, I had the the proof of concept, right? Right, which is this, right? It's like until I automated, delegated. Uh, hired and trained and developed leaders into my organization, then I had the capacity, time, and energy to go and help other companies, other people build seven-figure businesses. So that's very mm -hmm. important. Awesome, man. And where can people find out more information if they want to get in touch with you and, and find out more information about that? Carlos Ray is on Instagram. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, the one thing about me is that I'm never going to be one of those individuals that gets too big. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as like, you know, because I'm, I, 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 my upbringing is I'm from humble beginnings. Right. So anybody that ever reaches out to me, I always try to get back to them. I never want to be that guy that you know that douchebag. Too cool for school. Too yeah. cool for school. Not me. Never. Yeah. You know, I, I think I, I honestly believe that God will. God will take a lot away from me when I become that, if I ever become that guy. But the way that things are going now, it's like I'm actually headed in the other direction. Mm -hmm. I'm scaling and, you know, successfully becoming very successful mm -hmm. uh, to the point where, God willing, I believe in the next uh, 24 months, we'll actually, we're already an eight-figure, you know, eight-figure right. conglomerate. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that in the next 20, uh, 24 months, uh, we'll be a nine-figure conglomerate with other companies that we have launching here in the next 60 to 90 days. Mm -hmm. For, we're we're, uh, we're into the SaaS industry now, software as a service. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we, we, we've made so much money from real estate that we're, we're building out softwares now. Mm -hmm. So that's very helpful. But uh, I never want to be that guy that mm -hmm. never gets back to people. I'm always going to be grounded. So mm -hmm. you can reach me, Carlos Reyes. Um, I'm one of the few Mexicans out there that has like a little blue check mark, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> I haven't seen too many of them, but yeah. um, thank God I'm, I'm one of those uh, those guys out there. Carlos Reyes, I will always get back to people. Very cool, man. And then um, I want to zoom in. You said something earlier about risk aversion. Um, talk to me about how you, you know, with all these things going on, hundreds of properties you're dealing with. I mean, it must be hard to sleep at night, right? Some people have a hard time paying $10,000 in bills and overhead. You have hundreds of properties, you have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in overhead. Um, obviously, you've worked to that. You didn't just snap your fingers and deal with it. What advice do you have for people on how to take on more risk? Because a lot of people, as risk increases, their willingness to take on more risk decreases. Yeah. But I find the wealthiest people I own, um, I interview, that whatever they got going on or whatever properties they own or whatever it is, 
but they tend to almost take the more they have, the more they take off. I get excited, and then they yeah, it becomes a, I get ex- like it's a, a high. game. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a game. Exactly, it's a game. You're right. Yeah, but how? What advice and how would you recommend people get better at taking risks? Overcoming fear. Mm-hmm. That's that's pulling, what just pulling the trigger sooner than you feel comfortable more often. Man, yeah. well, h- hold on. I, I believe yeah. in calculated risk. Right. 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 I believe in calculated risk. I became an expert in my industry. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and that's how I started taking, you know, oh, we're gonna dump a million dollars this year in just marketing. That doesn't include mm-hmm. payroll overhead. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's do it. Because at this point, I'm measuring and I'm tracking my key perform key performance indicators, right? Yeah, I have a CFO that tracks, right? So for me, it's not really risk. Mm-hmm. Some people would consider risk, oh man, you just spent a million dollars in marketing. Well, according to my numbers, mm-hmm. right, it's saying that for every dollar I spend, I'm getting six back. You mm-hmm. see? So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's calculated risk now, but I, I didn't again, I didn't just like start there. I didn't exactly I didn't start there. I didn't wake up there, right? Yeah. You will gradually build yourself there. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of training yourself and your mindset to make that shift of I took a little risk. I got some back. Mm-hmm. I took a little more risk. I got more back. I took a lot of risk. I got more back. I'll tell you, uh, I'll give you a, a, a small little scenario. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my biggest risks that I took early on in my career. Mm-hmm. It was a portfolio of 27 properties. I had to put $100,000 non-refundable earnest money deposit on these properties. Mm-hmm. Um, I was scared out of my mind. Mm-hmm. You know, 100K back then, this was around, you know, 2016, 2016, right? What, what percent of your worth was it at that time? Mm, of your your liquid i would say yeah. well i would say about 20 20 to 30 percent but okay, yeah I, I see i didn't even think that way yeah, right yeah, yeah. You, like, you think that way now we think that way now because right. we're more experienced but i, I just thought a hundred thousand is a lot of money you right, know what i mean right, right? Uh, so i i, I put a hundred k down and and i'm like damn how am i going to close on these deals <laughs> right i gotta right, go find yeah. i gotta go find somebody that's going to help me close on these deals right yeah. i took a shot i, I didn't have I didn't have nothing lined up mm-hmm. on the other side of that. So imagine this, boom, you proof of concept, you make that happen. Now your brain's like, oh man, I better not even like give this guy any resistance because he's just going to overcome it like he's overcome all these other scenarios that I put in front of him. Again, you train yourself there at some point. Now it's like if you ask me to invest a million dollars into something, yeah, I'm going to analyze it and, and you know mm-hmm. cal- calculate the risk, but I'm not opposed to it. Mm-hmm. You see, so it's yeah, different, yeah. right? So you, you gradually get there for sure. Mm-hmm. And then what's the biggest, um, I guess, misconception people have about building wealth with real estate? Well, I, I, people really feel like you can't do it when people feel that you actually have to either come from a wealthy family or have money in the bank, a bunch of money or save a bunch of money or, you know, it's, there's so many, these are so many excuses and justifications. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can't be rich because I don't I, I don't come from a rich family. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can't be rich because I'm not educated. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, I can't be rich because I don't save I don't save money and I'm never, you know, like mm-hmm. the, I believe that there's a lot of misconceptions. It's not just one misconception. It's so many misconceptions across the board, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I feel like the biggest misconception is like people don't like people don't gamble on themselves. They gamble mm-hmm. on everything else. Right. They really don't. They, they don't gamble on themselves. And one thing that I, I'm I love to say Right, because I have this all in. I have a company, an education entrepreneur company called All In. Which is the right? hat you're wearing. Which yeah. is the hat I'm wearing. Yeah. I'll say this. Uh, when you bet on yourself, God goes all in with you. That's what people mm-hmm. don't understand. I believe that 100%. How, how, are you, right? how do you expect to really like scale and, and grow mm-hmm. if you don't even bet on yourself? How do you expect other people to bet on you? Yeah, or believe right? in you. Or believe yeah. in you. Or pay so, you or anything. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's a, that's a huge misconception. I want people out there to just... Take a shot on themselves, Mm -hmm. and I can promise them this. If they fail, they will grow, and they will get, at this point, they Mm -hmm. will come back, and they will come back even stronger Mm -hmm. with more capacity. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. They will. They will. They're not going to, they're like, wait a minute, I just went through that. I'm not going back to this. Mm -hmm. Like, good luck trying to convince me to ever have another job in my life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. So uh, I believe that people got to take more uh, risk on themselves. And then what about a big risk that you took that didn't pay off? Have you had something like that that yeah. just hit you in the gut? Yeah, I'm, I'm negative. Uh, definitely, you know, uh, I would say, well, here, uh, I'm, uh, in my solar company, I'm probably negative about five to 600,000, mm-hmm. right? But, yeah. but, but we estimated, mm-hmm. right? Well, <laughs> we launched our solar company 
And then uh, a few months, like eight months into it, boom, the pandemic hits, right? So <laughs> yeah. a lot of our stuff was face-to-face, door knocking for right. the solar company, right? Right. I actually used to knock doors, so yeah, I get it. Yeah. So, right? So then now it's like we, we had to uh, pivot and mm. uh, adapt mm. and went from like virtual, right? We went from virtual. So, But we estimated a uh, certain time period that we were going to be in the red until we know, hey, on this day, it's going to turn around, right. and then we're going to break even on this on this time frame, and then we're going to be green, mm-hmm. uh, you know, positive earnings uh, at this time. So mm-hmm. uh, these are things that you got to account for, for sure. So, yeah, so, so you just calculate the risk instead that, that, of looking yeah. at it like, ah, I failed, this is the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, okay, cool, on a long enough time horizon, it's just a short-term play in the long scheme. That's how green, yeah. a lot of businesses, mm-hmm. that's just how it is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very cool, man. And then uh, one thing I want to ask, is what are some of the biggest challenges in present day? Because a lot of people might see and go, oh, shit, multimillionaire, Carlos got it all figured out. Um, but no that's one's not arrived the reality. Yeah, no no exactly. one's arrived and nobody, I'm not Jesus, guys. Exactly. Like, I'm not, like exactly. no one's ever going to have that type of enlightenment and mm-hmm. no one's ever going to arrive. You know what I mean? Like we're exactly. always going to, I mean, we're humans, you know, we're, yeah. we're always going to be imperfect. So what, what are some present day challenges you're dealing with? Just because I want to zoom in for the audience so they can hear some of your own insecurities, your own worries at night, things that keep you up. Uh, maybe something you haven't shared before that is something you're currently in the trenches figuring out how to get out of. I've um, there, There's certain things that entrepreneurs uh, that we neglect mm-hmm. that are very, very important. Uh, one is our health. Right. Um, we neglect our health. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one thing that I want to, you know, really empower and encourage people out there. Mm-hmm. Do not neglect your health. Uh, Especially don't, when you're making good money, right? You like that good food? <laughs> yeah. Don't do, brother, yeah. I, I've been through, I've had... Uh, full, you know, mental breakdowns. Right. Uh, I remember September 2017, mental breakdown, went on Clonopin, went on Paxil mm-hmm. uh, just to get back on the horse, mm-hmm. right? I neglected my health. You know, I stopped doing the things that made me healthy. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the nutrition side of it, the, the working out. Um, that's one thing that I want people out there to really understand. Like, do not neglect your health. Do not feel that you're doing yourself a service by neglecting your health. Oh, but if I neglect my health, I can actually build this quicker. No, good luck. Like, mm-hmm. what's going to happen if you don't take care of yourself? You can't you know? sustain it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing that I want people out there to understand. The other thing is, do not neglect your family. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I believe that I did that for three to four years. Mm-hmm. I, um, I, you know, I was there obviously for the big things, but I, I was nowhere near the, the the husband and the father that I am today. Mm-hmm. I neglected my my wife uh, and I neglected my my uh, eight-year-old now, um, and I can see, like, I have such a great connection with my two-year-old, mm-hmm. but with my eight-year-old, I'm now constantly trying to, you know, build, get, that, build connection. that connection, yeah, yeah. like, like um, because I, for the first three to four years, you know, daddy was working, you know, 12, 16-hour days, you know, mm-hmm. so I want people to really understand that, that that's a constant battle, mm-hmm. Um for any entrepreneur mm-hmm. and, and every successful entrepreneur out there will understand that. Mm-hmm. And I love too, that you mentioned that you do so much for your family in terms of like paying for coaching for the kids and stuff like that. Yeah. Can you share some of the things in present Absolutely. day that you've done that I think would be inspiring for a lot of That's people? That's a... Because coming from a kid from Mexico, trying to come through the sewer, you'd never think he'd be a multimillionaire paying for coaching for his you know, kids uh, yeah. that are that young. So can you talk to me about that? And the one thing that I really want people to understand out there too is... You know, the the term being a multimillionaire now is like mm-hmm. whatever. Right. You know, I, I see it as like oh, whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. People in this office know like you, you wouldn't you wouldn't even be able yeah. to tell. You know, it's like yeah, I, I believe that I'm probably gonna be the same person, uh God willing, if God ever grants, you know, us mm-hmm. the the capacity to make it to the the B, right? Mm-hmm. Like the, the billionaire status. I, I have a few mentors that are billionaires mm-hmm. and I know what that's like. Mm-hmm. Um if we ever get there, um you know, it's 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 the the term million, multimillionaire is like now it's like everybody's a multimillionaire right. on social media, right? So, right. Um, so I want people out there to understand like it's not really like don't chase the money, right? Mm-hmm. Chase chase the accomplishments, right? Mm-hmm. Like chase chase the work, mm-hmm. you know, chase the work, chase, chase chase the challenges, chase the growth. That's one thing that I want people out there to understand. Do not. Man, do not suffocate yourself on like, oh man, I gotta make this amount of money, right? right? Don't 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 do that. And, and any but any like really massively successful because I know you've had some really great people on here. They'll probably tell you the same thing. That's like right. it's not even about the money. Yeah, yeah. So 
Uh, it's, about, it's about one foot in front of the other. That's it. Because how, how many people go, I want to make a million bucks. They don't do it and they get discouraged for three or four years versus the person that was just like, let me get one deal. Let me get another I'm better deal. better to that than I was yesterday. Deal. Yeah, exactly. Right? And pretty soon you look back and you're like, oh, shit, I didn't even notice we made 10 it, million it, It's a marathon. Yeah. It, it's yeah. not a sprint. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a marathon. Um, so I want I want people to uh, really understand that out there. You know, I don't want people to, you know, co- Comparison, right? It's like mm-hmm. comparison, right? Comparing Noya these days is, is, is like it's Comparing ridiculous. Noia, I like that's, that. Yeah. yeah, my mentor actually taught me that. Yeah. It's it, you know, it's 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 like like an all time high. It's like, mm-hmm. oh man, well, uh, if he drives this and I drive this, um, you know, oh he makes this amount of money, he has that watch, or he lives there. It, it, it's it, it really this. It's more discouraging, mm-hmm. and it robs you of like your joy and your and your your progress every day. That's yeah, one of the challenges of social media. Absolutely, yeah. but back back the one thing that I'm the most proud of that mm-hmm. money as a tool has been able to do for me and my family. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, retire my mom, retire my wife, right, and help you know help help out all kinds of different people you know, mm-hmm. and especially wherever I can. Right, mm-hmm. I'm very free willed with my with my money because I know what it's like not to have it. You know what I mean? Sure, yeah. Um uh, if if you ask, you know, even if you ask like Pat, right? Uh here. Our video. My, yeah. my my tips, my minimum amount of tips are in twenties. Mm-hmm. I don't tip fives, tens, right? I go grab a bunch of twenties mm-hmm. and you know, the valet guy, twenty, right? Mm-hmm. Um I usually tip, you know, even if the bill is under a hundred bucks, I'll tip fifty to hundred bucks, you know, on if on a, to a server, right? right, right. Uh, I'm very free will in that way because I I know like the joy and the contribution that's mm-hmm. coming, you know, the, yeah, from doing that. And what it's like to be on the other side of it too. What it's like to day. Yeah. what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck and suffer, right? Yeah. Um. So that's what I do love about money mm-hmm. is how I'm able to leverage it and actually help other people. Mm-hmm. That that's like. That's the biggest thing for me, man. Mm-hmm. So one thing that I've been able to do for my family is not only do I, you know, I have my personal development coaches, but I also like I pay well over six figures a year for their personal development coaches. My wife gets two sessions uh, a week mm-hmm. with my personal development uh, coach. And you can look her up, Tanya Oliver on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And uh, and my daughter gets two sessions a week. My eight year old, my third grader. You know, she's learning about consciousness, emotional intelligence, <laughs> right. frequency, right? Um, she, you know, she uh, she gets two sessions a, a week, and it's what is what that's done for our family. Um, there's no there's no price on that. It, it's mm-hmm. it's priceless. Yeah. The the joy and the harmony and the peace that I have at home, mm-hmm. right? You you can't put a price tag on that. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the biggest. That's the proudest I am about what money's been able to do for us. Wow, man, I love it. All right, last question I have before we wrap up here and then play a fun little game is, you know, for people around the world who are watching this, who are listening to this, men, women, any age out there who are looking at this story and going, holy shit, this is firing me up. You know, I want to do something with my life. I want to take it to the next level. I want to elevate. Being on the side of the fence that you're at now, obviously you still want to get to more and more levels, but a lot of people see you and think, shit, I could never, right? I'm sure at a certain level, you never imagined when you were a kid that this would one day be your office or you'd have this operation. So... What advice do you have for people out there who are trying to get to that next level but maybe stuck or have doubt or have worry or compare noia out there who are listening to your story? What do you hope they take from your story? Inspiration. Mm-hmm. Inspiration, right? That's something one of my mentors taught me is like inspiration is different than motivation. Inspiration means in spirit, right? Something happens inside. Like it's, they, they're impacted spiritually, you know, mm-hmm. emotionally to achieve more. I'll tell you what. Uh, I used to remember looking at some of the investors. Mm-hmm. It on Instagram, and I used to see them park their Mercedes Benz next to a flip that they were doing. Mm-hmm. And I used to, and sometimes they would take a picture of the checks, and that would inspire the hell out of me. <laughs> one, I'm like, one yeah. day I'm gonna be able to do that. Yeah. Like I was so inspired, and those guys now they love me and look up to me now, right? Yeah. Like it's 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 a it's just it's a beautiful thing, man. I was so, and I tell them this, I will always honor those people. Like mm-hmm. literally, I can show you messages from those people saying, "Hey, man." I, your content inspires me now, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm like, hey, brother, well, your content inspired me. You see, mm-hmm. I was inspired by you taking pictures of checks and you parking next to your fix and flips and your rehab properties and you being next to that all blacked out Mercedes Benz. You know, like I remember this vividly, mm-hmm. right? I was inspired. So I want people to look at me and, and anything that I've accomplished and be inspired and say, hey, you know what? I can do that too. Because that dude is where he is, and he wasn't even born here. Like, he wasn't even legal here. Like, he used to live in fear here. You know, he used to, 
every time like, oh man, when is immigration going to catch me and throw me back out? Right? Like, I want people to look at me and man, if that guy did it, I know that I can do it. And I'm inspired by that person because of what he's been able to do. Wow, man. That's what I want people to, to, to feel like. That's powerful, bro. Now, before we wrap up here, um, there's a game we always play called First Things First. The way the game works is I'm going to rifle off a word or phrase, and you just tell me the first word or phrase that comes to mind, right? Kind of like a relation game. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to rifle off 10 first words. First time or I phrases. ever played a game on a podcast, yeah. so this should be interesting. So the way it works, like I said, I'm going to rifle off a word or phrase, one at a time. So I'll say a word, and then you just respond back with the first either word back or phrase back. So it's open-ended. The only rule is that you can't repeat yourself twice. Okay. Make sense? <clears throat> All right. So ready? Yeah. Number one, money. Time. The number one lesson you've learned from your relationship with your wife after being with her 20 years. Work on it. Water your own grass. <laughs> oh, I like that. Water your water own, your own grass. grass. What if they don't water theirs or you perceive that they're not? Well, it has to be a two-way street. Right. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Third one's going to be um, your biggest limiting beliefs um, when you got into the game of real estate. That's tough because I've always, you know, but okay. Yeah. Um, Biggest limited beliefs. Uh, can you believe that's going to be the only question that? Yeah. Because yeah. it's it's tough for me, right? It's very. Uh, it, I guess what was okay. The fear. fear. Yeah. Fear. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Fear was a big thing. Uh, fear. Um, scarcity. Mm -hmm. Having a uh, a scarcity mindset mm -hmm. um, early on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and fear and scarcity actually like yeah. they're like cousins. So right. uh, I would say those two things. Um. The best advice you've ever been given in real estate? Man, uh, I'm going to say this. Uh, you know, how do children spell love? T-I-M-E. Mm -hmm. mm. How do children spell love? T-I-M-E. Mm. That's the best advice that I've ever been given. And uh, that's changed my life with my family. I love that. Um, the number one common denominator amongst your successful students? Believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, courage. Mm -hmm. They, it's believing, believing courage. They, um, just like we were saying earlier, they might not have it all figured out, but they believe, they believe in themselves. They believe, you know, and, and, and what their, uh, their goal and, and vision is. Mm -hmm. And then what they do is, uh, you know, they, they set that intention out there. And they work towards that intention, and uh, and then it happens. Mm. The importance of mentorship. I wish I would have started sooner. Mm -hmm. I wish that I didn't have the pride and ego and that chip on my shoulder. Well, it helped, but it you know, mm -hmm. to a you know, foolish pride, right? It, it helped to a certain extent, but I wish I would have paid mentors, hired mentors, mm -hmm. at a much earlier uh, stage in my career. Mm -hmm. um, I, it would have saved me from a lot of a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. What you hope people take away from not just your story, but when all is said and done, Carlos is no longer here. What do you hope the Carlos Reyes legacy stood for for your family for generations to come? Well, that I uh, I, I love people. Mm -hmm. Like I love people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm always looking to serve, and um, I believe that you know I I made I was I'm the lamb. I'm the sacrifice for my family. There has been no millionaires before me, but I hope that there's plenty of millionaires after me. I made the sacrifice. I put it all on the line. I put my life on the line for uh, my family. So mm -hmm. um, I hope that they uh, recognize the, the sacrifice. And then number nine, what you tell yourself on the tough days to get through it. Nothing's forever. Mm -hmm. This isn't forever. This isn't forever. Like I just... Yeah. You know, like nothing's forever. Yeah. Nothing's forever. One day at a time. Yeah. Just yeah. keep it moving. Yeah. Nothing's forever. Yeah. And then the last thing is as you look back and reflect, what advice would you give to that young Carlos at any age that was looking for answers, trying to get direction, trying to make things work, but maybe feeling stuck or maybe feeling limited? Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to that? Start sooner. Start sooner. I... Remember when I told you I got comfortable and became 
Americanized, no, no disrespect, obviously, to anybody <laughs> but yeah, out yeah, there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, start sooner. Mm-hmm. You know, start sooner. Start sooner. Believe in yourself sooner. You know, take action sooner. Try to overcome that fear sooner. Educate yourself sooner. And when I mean education, I mean the first book I ever read in my life, mm-hmm. uh, personal. So there was two books I read, like, literally at the same time. Up until uh, 2013, I'd never read a book, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up just listening to a bunch of Jay-Z lyrics, and that was my inspiration. Right, you, know I mean? yeah, yeah. A, you know, he's a hustler, and you can see the guy did well for himself, right? Right. Um, read uh, Flip by Nick Ruiz, which, by the way, I want people to doubt. My book is free if they just go to bestreibook.com, mm-hmm. bestreibook.com. Mm-hmm. Boom, free right into their phone for free, no charge. Um, I wrote a book for in honor to uh, the book that changed my life, right? Mm-hmm. So Flip and Secrets of the Millionaire Mind by T.R. Becker, mm-hmm. that book changed my life. So I love it. I would, yeah. Think bigger sooner. Start sooner. I love it. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Thank Carlos. You, brother. It was a pleasure, man. And Thank for you. you guys at home watching, make sure to check out Carlos. We have all of his links in the description below so you can follow him, get in touch, find out more, and also learn from him about how you can maximize your life and take it to the next level. As always, thank you guys for enjoying this episode. Make sure to like, share, subscribe. And also, if you'd like to share your story on the show and you feel like you're one of the passionate few, you can apply in the description below. But until then, live strong, live with passion, and we'll see you on the next inspiring episode. Thank you so much for enjoying this video. And if you found this content valuable, uplifting, and inspiring to take your life and your business to the next level, then I have some exciting news for you. Because the Passionate Few Academy officially launched our brand new on-demand training that you can access absolutely free at www.tpfacademy.com. Right there, you'll learn the number one way to grow your personal brand or business brand online fast. The same way I've learned from interviewing some of the most successful people on the planet right here on the show who've done exactly that. So again, don't forget to check it out, www.tpfacademy.com. I promise you, you'll be blown away. And also, don't forget, there's three ways you can connect with me further. Number one, you can text me absolutely free at the number on the screen right now and send me your most pressing life, business, or branding question, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Number two, if you'd like to be interviewed on the show, you can actually apply right now in the description below and apply to share your incredible story, brand, or business right here with an audience of potentially millions of people the same way we've helped experts, entrepreneurs, and authors just like you. And don't forget, that opportunity comes with the ability to partner with us and help feed one million people through our partnership with Feeding America. Again, you can click the link in the description below titled Interview Application to find out more. And last but not least, number three, if you'd like to get consulting from our team and work with you to help you grow your personal brand or business brand, no matter what industry you're in, we can do that by simply filling out the questionnaire in the description below titled Consulting Application. And if our team thinks that you'd be a great fit, who knows, you may just be invited to work with us to help you take your business to the next level. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for enjoying this video. Make sure to smash that subscribe button, turn on post notifications so you never miss an episode. And until next time, live strong, live with passion, and I'll see you in the next inspiring video.